Starting us off, we have two educators here from different areas of the country. Despite having worked together on this project for some time, this conference is the first time they are meeting face to face. <laughs> Carmen's very happy. From OCAD University in Toronto, Kathleen Morris is a maker, educator, and researcher working in the field of textiles. She's a faculty member in the MAAD, MAD Textile Studio, where she has taught since 2005. From the Emily Carr University of Art and Design in Vancouver, Alain Day Fraser is the Associate Dean of the Master and Design Program, co-director of the Material Matters Research Centre, and founder of the TARP, T-A-R-P, Textile Adaptation Research Program. From 2013 to 2018, Alain was the principal investigator of a SSHRC Insight-funded research in initiative, Clothings as Conversation. These two presenters are tackling a collaborative research project, and they're here to tell us about their first phase of the program. Please welcome to the stage Kathleen Morris and Alain Day Fraser. Thank you. It's really great to be here um, this afternoon, and I think we've been introduced, so we can just move into the sure. project. Sure, hey? that sounds yeah. good. Okay. Before we start, uh, just a thank you to uh, Megan and Victoria for making this conference happen and the immense workload you took on to do so. Um, so uh, we're here to, to speak about a, a SHRC-funded um, uh, project that we're working on. I need to be closer. Um, and this is the title. So it's entitled Thinking Through Craft in the Digital Turn, and the project brings together educator practitioners from post-secondary craft programs across Canada to examine the ways in which digital technologies intersect with traditional hand fabrication processes. So we're going to offer up a range of perspectives um, from the Cross Canada team just to start us off in terms of the things that each of us have uh, sort of reflected on in terms of the work we do. I'm going to try and do this clicker. Yeah. Wait. <laughs> We're really challenged by the digital. <laughs> Got it. Um, so when we first started this project, um, so as as when we were introduced, Kathleen and I have not met until till in person until today, we've had a lot of conversations with a lot of people in the group. And one of the first things that we did um, with all of our colleagues across Canada was begin to um, interview one another to begin to sort of get a uh, window into what, why it was we were interested in this project and potentially what it was that we had to offer um, and to sort of help us reconsider um, the craft field and specifically uh, craft and the digital term. So as a research project, Thinking Through Craft and the Digital Turn recognizes that the infiltration of digital technologies into our classrooms and studios has markedly impacted the way teaching and learning occurs and challenges our deeply rooted understandings of pedagogy, skill, and indeed notions of craft itself. The Shirk Research Initiative invites team members to approach the project from their own set of experiences as we grapple with some of the research questions. Um, so pulling things together and finding connections, watching for the anomalies and the affordances that resonate, and coming to terms with the craft in this contemporary context. The two, two previous studies informed this work um, by Dory Millerson and Lynn Heller out of OCAD in Toronto. Um, and this, they were very much, from my perspective, the two that began to gather us all together. Mm -hmm. um, so we're looking at how digital technologies intersect and combine with traditional mechanical and hand fabrication processes. And we're working through, with, and around in a conversation about material and the digital. And when we're doing that, we're thinking about several things. We're thinking about new ways of engaging with materials um, and the processes we use about embodied learning, about embodied knowledge, and what that means to us as makers and crafts practitioners. We're thinking about questions of access, both in terms of the sites that places are, and also the ways, ways that we work between materials as craft practitioners. And through this all, we're thinking about meaning making, and what that means in terms of the work we do. 
<clears throat> so post-secondary craft programs have been complicit in both shaping and reflecting a specific connotation of craft. For example, many of our programs have long upheld an arts and crafts informed curriculum, one that relies on notions of mastery, of medium, disciplinarity, and an emphasis on authorship. The studio craft movement that emerged in the 20th century did so in tandem with post-secondary education fostering a conception of craft as distinct and separate from other fields. <clears throat> we have seen how pedagogy not only imparts the skills and methods of craft-related disciplines, but the way in which it can funda fundamentally transform a broader cultural understanding of the term craft itself. So craft, um, I think, it's worth uh, considering the work of this particular, particular craft practitioner. Aaron O'Soran is currently at Emily Carr University. He came there to do his Master of Design, um, but he was trained at Sheridan and, and then went on to work um, in Toronto's Harbourfront program. Um, he's had apprenticeships all over the world with glassmakers um, in the Netherlands, in Italy, in the US, and in Japan. Um, so he's deeply, deeply ste steeped in glass um, the image on your left is a freeze frame of an animation based on the data that Aaron pulled off the net uh, when he began to sort of rethink his craft. Um, and he took that image and then moved it into a CAD rendering, which was then 3D printed. So the, the image on your right is a, a 3D printed mold, which he then um, placed glass in and, and put it into the kiln. So not a, not a, a hot shop sort of scenario, but more in terms of working with, with the kiln. Um, so it's fairly still looking here, and then we flip to the next image, which was a video, but I don't have the video. So if you could imagine, essentially, the first thing that this, this glass blower did was create a series of animations based on data that were these bubbles that move around the screen. And after doing that, then he moved on to actually capture the pieces and make a whole series of forms. So going from his deep, steep, steep knowledge into this digital and then onwards. In my own teaching practice, I'm aware of how a spectrum of approaches can function seamlessly <clears throat> as integrated stages in the making process, and also when they do not. So for example, in my constructed textiles course, we plan woven projects with software that are then executed on the loom. <clears throat> the woven textile may then be scanned and used as a digital repeat pattern for surface design. It may become a costume or a prop in, time, in a time-based media performance. It may be sewn into a garment using pattern making software, and it may be laser cut or stitched on a digital embroidery machine before doing so. Ultimately, the subjectivity of the maker is at the core of all of these processes, and the stages can represent an expanded set of tools in the toolbox. We're looking here at the work of fourth year uh, student Kadisha Aziz, and on the left, we see a, a digital print that was scanned from one of her oil paintings. The piece is very tiny. It measures two inches by three and a half inches. But it became the first stage in the process of a series of manipulations. So Aziz prints on paper, then distorts the image through the scanning process before printing on fabric. She then distorts through scanning before moving back to paper. And she repeats this process multiple times. In between, she stitches and beads the work. So the image on the right, Arrival, <clears throat> measures eight by 10, and it's the fourth iteration of this process. And Aziz speaks about the memory of beads and ink scraped from the previous prints. Uh, an image of the textile uh, print studio there. And, um, and then this, this, I'll say final work, although it may not be, um, it's a result of these uh, series of manipulations. So the viewer is able to see the relationship between the digital pixels and the woven structure of the fabric. The work contains layers upon layers of memories of the original painting, which have been manipulated by the artist's hands. So influx can be interpreted as part of an endless series as well as its own entity. Okay, um, so material. There's something in the craftsperson's connection 
and understanding of the medium. With the onboarding of new processes, in this case 3D printing, and the new materials alongside it, uh, the craft practitioner, um, in this case a ceramicist, is faced with dealing with new affordances. Um, this is an example of a midpoint um, of work which the ceramicist did over and over again in order to actually begin to refine and perfect this, this, this glitched piece. So he was see seeking an unglitched uh, scenario. Um, this is clay. It's also 3D printed. Um, and this is sort of, a, sort of an alternate sort of perspective, I think, in terms of how we as craft practitioners engage with materials. So in this particular case, um, when faced with a 3D print that starts to glitch, the craft practitioner then began to work with the mistake as opposed to refining it. So I think it's worth sort of thinking about how we enter in and engage. And then this one is silicon. And it um, sort of is an interesting sort of piece in terms of just another medium. So all of these are 3D printed, very, very different sorts of forms coming out of it. Um, the reason I put this one up, I used to have a video of it, is actually just a sort of a, a note to self in terms of as craft practitioners as we produce things, but perhaps not to take things too seriously. Um, and that there is something replete in the sort of sometimes in the work that we do. So um, I'll just describe what happens when you push on that, that silicon piece of form it does this amazing sort of zing up and flies into the air. So it is, <laughs> it in itself has, has this wonderful gesture. Um, so it's still moving with 3D printing and just sort of reflecting on digital tools and these new capacities that they enable the craft practitioner. This form I don't think is possible um, except in the build of a 3D printer and that striation level. Um, and what comes out of these sorts of things is interesting the form may, may be different, but we, but we still, as craft practitioners, end up reflecting on old legacy ways of making. So that form is a vase. <clears throat> so in considering the synergies between hand fabrication processes and digital tools, questions of access to those tools become important. Mm -hmm. Who is operating the digital tools and does this affect how we understand the object that results? A situation in my third year textiles course highlighted the impact of this concern. So this fall, I had planned a jacquard design project with the local arts center where students would weave their digital files on a TC2 loom. Uh, when the project suddenly fell through, I reached out to a studio in Quebec, Louise Lemieux Berube, your studio. <laughs> Uh, to weave the files in an effort to keep the jacquard component in the course. So the first scenario would have involved a student at a loom executing a design, albeit a design that, that would have been wholly controlled by the loom. It calls into question our understandings of craft. Uh, the second scenario restricts students to the preparation of the digital file and results in the identical textile being woven and again calls into question as to how we perceive this artifact and process. Do these definitions even matter? If we move beyond terminology, it's interesting to consider how the perspective of either a teacher or a student may inform whether there is a firm division that is dictated by process. So I'm gonna fill in the blank because there used to be a slide there which was actually sort of a screenshot of what it looks like when you're working with a TC2 loom and, and the actual weaving. So I'm sorry, it's we're out of sync. <laughs> <laughs> um, so on to sort of other sort of pieces to, related to um, the way that we make as craft practitioners. Um, I think there's insight that turns up um, from when we move from one medium to the next. And, and this, from my perspective, really interests me. And it's certainly in terms of the dialogue that we've been having, is sort of a cross Canada piece. Um, so this is the work of a communication designer in a research lab. Um, it's a case of someone who is deeply steeped in digital craft, of illustration, of typography, and grids. And a recent body of work that this person has done, um, working up with these initial images in Illustrator, so in a, gra in a digital interface, and then moving to a tufting machine as material output. So from the flat screen uh, to a shag rug sort of scenario. And one of the really interesting things about speaking with her about her work is how she's sort of reshifting and considering what it means to work in this different medium. 
um, and acknowledging that there is something very different that comes out of, uh, that is different from the digital space when she translates it into a medium. So the scale, um, the weight of the machine, the yarns themselves all end up, up sh shaping, reshaping the way she's thinking. So moving from the, the medium of pixels to that of yarn instead. So I recently uh, came to know a ceramicist from California, um, who is also a firefighter. Um, and this is a simple uh, 3D ca uh, CAD rendering, 3D printed, they're 3D printed flasks, and they're made from local clay. So the California ceramicist, uprooted and now in Canada, has been digging up earth um, and speaking with other ceramicists about clay deposits in and around the lower mainland. Um, and when I've had conversations with him, much of this has to do with his sort of reflecting on, on this new place and the sites and where he now resides. Um, so he's doing this by walking and digging up and then bringing it into the lab and then moving it into 3D printing. Um, the, another, an interesting thing, I, I think, in terms of this particular piece, which they look fairly nonchalant, they're beautiful forms, is actually what he intends to do with it. Um, so he is actually, uh, he's lined up to do some summer work, um, firefighting in BC. He, um, so, and his intent at this point is to deposit these flasks um, in, in amongst the fires uh, when he is, as he's working as a firefighter. So essentially, uh, deposit the flask, and then as he works um, to, uh, while he's working to arrest and stop, um, the fires progress across the new terrain. So these sort of peculiar sort of switches between site, place, material. Earlier today, uh, Michael Peterson was, was giving us sort of examples of what happens when you go into community and engage. And um, I think that is a re something that's really important to, for us to think of as craft practitioners. And this also is in, when we think about it in terms of the digital interface. So um, this circle is uh, very significant to me. It's, um, it's actually in a motion capture studio. And uh, it's in a motion capture studio that hosts a lot of events, but uh, it's become a, this circle of, of chairs has become a, a re repeat process as a group of um, researchers where, where I am based uh, meet up with um, an indigenous collective called Frame Sovereignty. So um, 12 um, artists and designers who are working from their crafts um, and looking at the digital space. And what happens, what's happened over time is that um, in terms of this place of how you meet and you gather people, um, we have begun to meet in circles, and it's, it's changed the rhythm and the pace that we work. I'm someone who fills in space with lots of words and sort of jumps to and wants to get going. Um, and working with the Frame Sovereignty Collective has completely shifted the way myself and others uh, sort of think about the processes we use. And I'll just say that that sort of, that comes with land acknowledgements, time and pace and rhythm completely shifting um, and reconsidering. And what we're seeing in terms of how that resides um, and works for, both, for, for everyone involved is, is an incredibly rich piece. So this is uh, Rachel Clifford. Um, the, the body of work was actually from 2010 when Richard, when Rochelle, sorry, came to um, do her Master of Applied Arts in Design. Um, and it's an example of a really important provocative piece of work uh, connected to place. Um, so, it, and it's one of, it's one of a, few pieces that began to sort of lead to a really rich discussion about craft and indig indigenous ways of knowing um, and making the institution that she was studying and really reconsider um, how things were done. Leading to this 10 years later. So the Frame Sovereignty Collective that I spoke about earlier, um, this, is, this is a picture of everybody gathered around the 3D printer. Um, and, and this sort of, this piece of like, um, people sort of shifting the ways that they think about making and the conversations that go along with it. I think I'll leave it at that. Uh, I think it's ironic that it's a blue light, not a fire, orangey light, fire, fire. Okay. Um, earlier today, I asked um, our keynote speaker a question to do with VR, and I'll own up that this is the reason why. Um, this is the work of Nithical Nim Kolrat, who happens to be a colleague of both Kathleen and myself. Uh, Nithical is now at um, OCAD. Um, she comes to us to Canada via way of, from Thailand via way of Finland and Estonia, and she has this incredible rich practice of knotting. So it's almost like a macrame form. She knots, she knots forms. She she creates full scale tables, beds, chairs, um, and in this case, uh, cup and saucer. 
And she, um, she turned, this is actually a, an intense body of work that she did over two and a half month period. Um, she created the, uh, a cap and saucer using this paper knotting technique and then proceeded to scan um, these images and 3D print them. And it's really interesting um, in terms of that particular body of work because she went from embodied ways of knowing like this to a production that is striated. Um, so it became a really interesting material exploration. Um, but it was also a sticking place. And one of the things that happened really early on um, in about, I think she'd actually gone for about a month trying to do this, um, scanning, crashing scanners, um, working with a Wacom tablet to try and re make these knot knots. And she couldn't get it. And unfortunately, there was a VR setup right next door, and she's the one who used this VR setup. And in the space of two minutes, she knotted the configuration that she'd been trying to do for, for months. And, and so watching her do this piece was really intriguing to me. Um, when she does it in, um, with the paper, it's really, they're tiny, it's really small, but it's still, it's scaled up, she could still do it. And I think that's worth us considering when we think about the acts of making and the way that we engage our craft, whether it's with ceramics or textile or wood or metal or glass, there's something in the gestures that we hold that actually is embedded knowledge. Mm -hmm. This is something that Michael Peterson touched on in his presentation, valuable information. <clears throat> I'm gonna circle back to questions of digital access because I think they're once again critical to this conversation. In particular, who is afforded access and who is not? If a student has been able to control a digital tool in the production of their work, what happens after graduation <clears throat> when this is done by a third party? A current fourth year student who relies on disrupting a 3D printer commented that she will only be able to produce her work when she's enrolled in school. So shared studio models exist, but Ellen and I are both in prohibitively expensive cities and there are certainly financial obstacles to um, both renting space and acquiring digital tools, or for that matter, paying for some of the digital services. So does this unwittingly create barriers and put digital access only in the hands of a few? So we thought we'd give you three examples. They're all ceramics based um, in terms of the ways, um, both in terms, this is sort of us thinking about um, access in terms of the institution, but also access the, the ways that we, as different individuals doing different practices, come to these spaces. So this is the work of Paul Mathieu. Um, he, is, he is an expert in his field. He's been working for four, over 40 years um, creating uh, with ceramics, creating a wide range of forms. Um, this is a particular provocation. He has a tendency to like to provoke um, in really wonderful ways. And uh, in this particular case, he took um, this uh, idea of the Mobilis script and um, uh, sort of essentially gave himself a project uh, to create a ceramic form that could only be created uh, in, on a, in a digital interface. Um, I think the thing to note with this is that uh, Paul, when he works, he has his own practice, but when it moves into digital, it is very much with the research assistants that he pulls on board. And they, in fact, are the ones with the digital expertise. So they're working through with Paul Mathieu in that way. But so this, this piece of an expert sort of going into the digital space as a novice. So the next example is complete sort of reversal of that. Um, this is the work of a third year undergrad student at M uh, Emily Carr, um, who's actually a <laughs> open source hacker of anything. He's always, he's breaking machines and making new ones. He's very digitally proficient. Um, and this is his first foray into working with ceramics. So what does the novice do, uh, the, the digital proficient, the, do, the, the digital proficient, the material novice do? He records a thunderstorm and he takes the data from the thunderstorm and creates an algorithm that allows him to create a whole series of printed cups. And he then goes about printing them and having conversations with ceramicists who are expert in their field about the implications and what this means in terms of the making. Um, and the, there's sort of a, a bit of joy in that one too, I think. Um, and so the last example that, that we have here is again a, a piece in terms of a coming from ceramics, but what happens when someone, um, in this case a designer in residence, is working with a 3D printing ceramics, but decides to do it flat. So he's using the piece more in terms of 
what happens if I create a repeat form digitally and I print it flat? And then I'm sorry, I'm not a ceramicist, though I do remember learning a long time ago. Um, essentially creates a four panels and, and, and assembles them, old school method, right? So he 3D printed the piece, then he's assembling, and then he's moving around. So uh, just another way of engaging um, with back and forth with medium. Yeah. So our discursive understanding of craft has expanded in recent years as theoretical models have broken down some of the inflexible categorization that has long informed our field. Rather than seeing craft strictly as a noun that describes specific objects, there has been a rethinking of disciplinary boundaries. Craft has become a means of thinking through themes like gender, identity, self, labor, resistance, community, to name a few themes. Many of these meanings relate to the connotation of craft as embodied, slow, and autonomous acts of making. So can we continue to think through craft in the digital domain? It's interesting to consider the ways in which digital tools might impact the unfolding theoretical discourse, and by extension, change and broaden an understanding of craft as a whole. So that that brings an end to our presentation. Oh, I, I <laughs> so we'll fill in the gaps. We we had another version of this slide with a yeah. whole series of icons. We've had so we've had several versions of this presentation. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> um, but essentially, just uh, w w was a general sort of thank you and call out to yeah. all the different institutions that we're part of. This is the very beginning of a, of a three-year project. And um, for all of you in the room, it, uh, w if you are at all interested or have an opinion one way or the mm -hmm. other, we would very much like to hear from you. Mm -hmm. We're in the process of doing a Cross Canada survey. Um, and actually, we've had some really interesting discussions about that um, today. So part of it is gathering the information. And we're also, a lot beyond the survey, trying to think of other ways of engaging, sort of um, like some of the things that were spoken about earlier this morning in terms of participatory making sort of activities to enable us to amass and better understand the, the, the craft network um, across Canada and, and hopefully sort of give us some, some tools that we can all use moving forward. 